And thank you for joining us today. Today, our special guest is Dr. Radley Griffin. The Dr. Tommy Show is brought to you by Atlas MD, the preeminent medical software for membership medicine practices. To learn how you can try Atlas MD for free for 60 days, go to AskDrTommy.com and click on the special offer for Atlas MD. And without further ado, the preeminent concierge medicine practice in South Tampa. Founder, Dr. Radley Griffin. Radley, uh, thank you for coming up here. Thank you for having me, Tommy. No problem. And we are excited to have you here because when I first started doing concierge medicine, you were already established in South Tampa. And here we are, what is it? I think it's about seven or eight years later. Right. And nine years maybe even. And uh, so far, so good, right? Yeah. You know, I'm thinking back to that day we met uh, down the street from my office. You were in your fellowship training with sports medicine and, mm-hmm. and you already had a... a uh, an inkling that the establishment was not for you and uh, wanted to reach out to those of us who are already doing it. I think at the time there were only a handful of us in the Bay Area yep. even thinking about this. It was you, uh, Stacy Robinson, and Michael O'Neill. Correct. And I went yeah. and visited all three of you. Yeah. <laughs> and, and we do. They're all still there. Right. And uh, we that's one of the things about our, our fraternity. We like to collaborate with each other and because the – the challenge is, uh, I think, pretty uniform for all of us. Yeah, one of the challenges that we've had recently is um, is uh, decreased calls to the office. And uh, I don't know if that's a systemic thing or not. And uh, I was talking to Tracy about it. I said, you know what's weird is that, you know, suddenly uh, no one's, not no one, but we have had decreased. So that's one of the things is our, our membership is not driven ours, meaning concierge medicine, direct primary care, is not driven by some model right. where people just get this uh, card in the mail and say, hey, here's your new doctor. His name is such right, <laughs> He's right. near your house or he may not be near your house or right. pick one out of this book. So we actually have, uh, you know, we're kind of more oriented towards consumers. And so what we do is not necessarily, I think it's kind of similar, more similar to uh, a financial advisor or attorney or something, mm-hmm. whereas you don't really – uh, you're offering a medical service, but I think sometimes what we do is so different from ordinary right. medicine that you can't even use their same cycle. That's right. It, you know, it's it, in the beginning, we, we looked at different, I say we, my wife and I started the practice in 2008. And just to give a little history, uh, she abandoned her career to more or less help me start this practice. Uh, and you know, that's the neat thing about starting any business. You you, you don't know what you're doing mm-hmm. and you try different things, uh, especially at the time. There weren't a lot of mentors around to really guide us uh, through this process. So in the beginning, we tried different things as far as uh, direct mailers, um, magazine ads. Uh, we didn't go so far as to place billboards, but yeah. uh, we we really found that through the through the years, the our biggest driver of, of phone calls and referrals um was really our own patients. Exactly. Yeah. And I think most people have, uh, I've spoke to at least find that. And the right. key is, is that, you know, I think you and I talked about it before. You told me at some point you build a nucleus of, uh, I call it a critical mass. And sure. then it kind of almost, you know, you tell me about it because, you know, you're there already. You've got to that point where it's kind of, it's got a mind of its own. Not that sure. you don't have to, you know, promote yourself or market at all, but it's already it's self-generating. It, right, and what's so interesting about it is, you know, in the beginning when you're when you're thinking about the concept of, of concierge medicine uh, and and really the the benefits, I think when you're involved in it, you're you're wowed every single day about this style of medicine, how it benefits not only the patients but it, it benefits uh, us as physicians, and mm-hmm. it's the. You, you look at the other side of the fence, and I, I've heard you say many times, I, I can't go back. Oh, yeah. Um, It'd be and, tough. Yeah. I mean, if they told me that, if God, not going well, I don't think it's going to happen, but if God forbid they pass some type of law, call it the equal access law, call it the anti discrimination law, or anyway, some kind of law, because that's what they like to couch it in is, you know, you're discriminating against people who can't pay, right. just like, you know. But anyway, if they came along and passed some law and says, look, you have to do it this other way, right. I would quit. Right. I would say, okay, well, good. I'm going to become uh, whatever. Pick it, pick it. I don't know. I'll it, find a job somewhere. Once you're, yeah, you're right. Once Home you're Depot. on this side, uh, it's it's you just, you're just thrilled every day to be a part of this process for sure. Uh, but really from a, going back to what generates our, our, our patient referrals, 
is that demonstration when when we as physicians are just enamored with what we're doing and how we're practicing medicine and we're getting so and we're learning each and every day yeah. uh, and trying got- to teach our audience, uh, meaning our patients, really uh, what we're learning and then mm-hmm. they're sharing what they're learning with us and we're 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 melding the two worlds to create something really terrific for that person. And that's really longevity, but also health prevention, but also just really living great. And I think that, I think that is, um, it's contagious and patients are feeling when they feel that, that relationship with their provider, with their doctor, uh, like all of us, we, we want the best for ourselves, but we also want the best for our loved ones. And so when we think we're in something great, mm-hmm. uh, especially my family, we tend to you want to uh, share it, want to share it. And mm-hmm. I think that's um, so we 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 revel in the the uh, I think the energy that that these type of practices create and. And it's been a really great thing in that sense. Yeah, back to your point about learning from the patients. Today, we just you know, one of our patients came in. They dropped off a product. He said, "Hey, I go to an acupuncturist, mm-hmm. and uh, he, he he gave me this, and it works really well." And so, you know, that's one of the things. You know, I don't pretend to certainly know everything it is about medicine or concierge medicine or anything. And so, we learn from our patients, and they right. like to share you know what works for them. Right. And so, I'm always open to you know trying new things as long as they're not. Completely out of left field. <laughs> That's right. So when you first started, you know, take us back. You were starting off. You you were in the successful commercial practice. I right. think you were like a, weren't you like a director? Uh, right. I was, uh, it was in New York as a part of a uh, growing, uh, fast growing family practice uh, in the Bronx and upper Manhattan. Um, and I think we were even expanding out to Queens. And the practice just grew by leaps and bounds. It was uh, really quite something. And it was what I would call traditional primary care mm-hmm. in the sense that uh, at the time, this is pre-electronic medical records. Uh, it was um, really volume type care mm-hmm. as, as we've become to know family practice as mm-hmm. volume. Uh, at the a lot time, of complex patients probably. Very much so. Complex uh, uh, population and we were we were just running them through, and mm-hmm. it would, they were busy days. Our days were extremely long, ten hour days, and we were seeing back to back to back. And we, we calculated at one point it was a seven minutes and forty five seconds per patient. And I think that's probably generous if you I, look I at it now. So. Yeah, if you look so. at it now. Yeah, uh, we've had patients come in here who. Yeah, I don't want to speak ill of any other physicians, but they've been in physicals where they're not even touched. Correct. And that's obviously that. Can't, so you transition from that. That wasn't what your liking was. Who who did you know who was in concierge medicine? Because I I first knew Michael O'Neill. Right. And then I Google searched. I don't know if Google was back then, but anyway, I did it, and then I found you. And so who'd you how'd you, who'd you know? Or there when well when we decided, my wife and I decided to leave New York. And, and moved to Tampa, uh, we really moved based on an inkling that I, I wanted to do something different mm-hmm. and had, had no real plan. It was just a, a dissatisfaction uh, professionally. And it was that the system with which in which I was working did not work for me professionally, meaning I needed more time. I needed to be more thoughtful. Uh, I didn't want to spend my time in the room just writing prescription refills that a another physician wrote. I wanted to be able to collaborate more. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we we decided to move back down to Florida where we're both from. And I uh, worked in Tampa for my fourth year training. And uh, a mentor of mine, Dr. Eric Harrison uh, at Harrison Cardiovascular, he uh, he wanted me to come to Tampa. He, he thought there was a primary care shortage and he thought that, and he, uh, I have five brothers and four of us are physicians and he mm-hmm. worked with my, my brothers as well. And he said, we need some primary care doctors in South Tampa. So he, he took it upon himself as a, as a member of, of his community to recruit who he thought would be a good addition to the community. And in particular, he thought concierge medicine would be a good idea. Or well, did you think that? Well, no, neither of us did initially. We thought, hey, let's just get established. Uh-huh. Um, let's see. He, he has a very... Uh, terrific way of practicing medicine. I would, I would call it very personalized, uh, uh, precision based medicine. And he, uh, being my mentor, I, I liked the way he practiced. It was very individual. What works for one person does not work for the other. He mm-hmm. didn't, he didn't follow an algorithm. Uh, each patient had their own algorithm. Right. And, and I love that. I think that's, that's 
concierge medicine uh, personified. Yeah. So he, he said, let's get you down here. Let's start working together and let's see what uh, comes from it. So um, the idea was to come down and maybe join another practice and looked into that joining another family physician in the area. And we thought maybe we would do a sponsorship where one of the local hospitals would sponsor sure. a physician. Because, Popular thing to do. Right. And you looking over the the arrangements, I, I thought, well, gosh, this this practice, nothing against this practice in particular, but it's it's not unlike what I was leaving. Right. And said, I you know, I don't know if that's the right path. It's like for jumping me. from the frying pan into another frying pan. Well, that's right. And you just think, gosh, I don't know if that's the the path for me. And at the time, my wife uh, and I recently married, not even a year. We said, you know, let's let's see if we can carve our own path. And and through talking with with Dr. Harrison, he mm-hmm. he mentioned, well, what do you think about concierge medicine? Because he was new to the to the concept as well. Mm-hmm. And I said, well, what is that? And he said, well, you know, it's uh, where you, your patients pay you a retainer and you just sort of take care of them. So you were referred to concierge medicine from a non primary right. care doctor. How cool is that? It, it's really cool, and it it just goes to show that you when you. Uh, I think like-minded people tend to attract and, and right. they tend, there tends to be, uh, when that happens, um, ideas uh, happen as well. And so he introduced us to um, a really terrific couple in Clearwater, uh, Dorota Matuzowitz and her husband, uh, Charlie. Yes, I've seen that. And they were an established practice uh, several years before I came to town. Mm-hmm. And it was a it was a really neat experience where we, we called... Dr. Matuzowicz asked, can we come over and meet with you? Mm -hmm. And my wife and I went over and we we saw Dr. Matuzowicz and and her husband and they were running a a really terrific, successful micro practice. Mm -hmm. And it was it was really encouraging. They I remember to this day, Dr. Matuzowicz looking me in the eyes and saying, you're going to do this. You're going to do well. Yeah, and, and I think as as you and I, I think were, you may have told me the same thing. <laughs> I did. <actually. laughs> I think you did. You can you can look at people in in the space, and you can there's there's just something about it. You know who's who's made for this and who's not. Well, you know what? Thinking about it back then, that's a very it's like a light at the end of the tunnel, or almost like you're getting a. a I mean, I was I wasn't even in practice yet I mean, after graduation, but here I was in fellowship, thinking that I wanted to do this, pretty much knowing that I wanted to do this, and then I met with met with you and you I think you said those exact words and I remember thinking damn this is real because is it it seemed like it was it was you know when I first started medical school it seemed like graduation from medical school was like almost or when I first started training it felt like graduation right. from medical school, medical school was almost eternity away then it finally came then I got in the training and then you say well heck one day you will have your own practice and you and I was thinking wow this is absolutely you could this is actually feasible because mm-hmm. here's here's this doctor who's actually doing it you know, it's such an empowering thing. And I think mm-hmm. for physicians out there, if you're watching, you know, take some time to explore your options if you're, you're quote burned out. You know, there's not quote burned out if you're burned out. So much of burnout is nothing to do with patients. Right. I mean, not patients directly. It's having to do with trying to deal with patients, trying to deal with coding, trying to deal with, you know, all of the crushing bureaucracy, all these, you know, did you, did you performance of, is your, is your uh, values, whatever they do. I don't even know what mm-hmm. they do over there anymore, but they're constantly berated with emails telling them you have to do this. You have to do this. You have to do this. Did you watch this video? If you didn't, we're going to fine you and then, or, 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 you know, otherwise penalize you. It's just ridiculous. And there's a way out. It's like a life preserver. Right. It was in, in the interesting part of my journey and I, I'm, I think I'm thankful for this, is that I didn't have to go through that uh, complete uh, metamorphosis. I, I think you and I were, are the lucky ones in the sense that we recognized a that we would be dissatisfied in that space. Um, and maybe we're egomaniacs. I don't know what it is. but <laughs> Maybe. I tell you what, though, some, there's a truth to that. Because if yeah. you ever meet a physician who wants to do this, and they don't feel like they have very good control of what their belief right. system is. And if right. they're kind of amenable to yeah, whatever, they might not make it. Because you right. have to have kind of, you have to have be wanting to be in charge yeah. at some level. That is to be the owner. Now, you can work in a system where you're not the one in charge, but you're part of a team. But either way, you're still going to want to be in charge because you're in charge of your patients. But this is not for someone who's just kind of a... I'll just go with the flow, whatever, you know, I'll adapt. You know, they have this book called Where's My Cheese or Who Moved My Cheese. 
<laughs> and we read that, and I remember thinking, I don't know if the, I didn't read it. I was supposed to have, but anyway, I said, I don't know if I just want to show up and adapt because it was about like if someone moves your cheese, then you got to go just find the cheese. And there was some, you know, the other mouse was kind of like becoming distracted, and the mouse that succeeded was the one that just didn't worry about move the cheese. So there's some of that is positive, but I think the overall effect is is that look, I don't want to someone move my cheese. I want the cheese, and I'll I'll put it wherever I want it. But yeah. anyway. Um, some of this has got you have to be driven and you have to have, like you said, like an ego, a healthy ego. Yeah, I, I think, and a lot of that's lost, I think, on us in the beginning. And we're not quite sure where it comes from. And I think for me, what what I I didn't have any ideas of what I wanted and uh, in the beginning, it was really the idea that I wanted more time with my patient uh, because I needed the time. I needed the time to be thoughtful mm-hmm. uh, and take my time and really run through a lot of items on the list. I mean, you mm-hmm. think back to the days of my practice where the nursing staff is telling the patients, you only get two problems to bring up today. Yeah. And you just think, gosh, that's really how it is for for our colleagues out there. Yeah. And for, for to have that change and say, hey, what what are all the items we need to address today? Mm-hmm. And then when you address all those items, then you you realize, hey, I can really start making a difference from a nutritional aspect and a fitness aspect. And you find that if you can stabilize some of the medical issues, you can really start diving into prevention for these folks. And and that's what really we've created our, at, at Griffin Concierge Medical and, and bringing in uh, other providers is really creating the environment and the culture where these relationships can really be fostered. Mm-hmm. And so um, I think I think it, the the movement does take folks like you and I um, to to start these practices. Mm-hmm. Um, but there are physicians out there who who may not be entrepreneurs, um, but they may not be risk takers. But they do love the idea of having more time with their patients, right. being thoughtful, find being having that one on one, treating that patient like an individual, yeah. not like a number. Absolutely. And how how fulfilling is that for us? It's terrific. Yeah, and they talk about the physician shortage and talk about how, you know, doing what we do is exacerbating a physician shortage, which I think is a non a non issue because truth of the matter is is you can have a big panel of patients. And you may say that you have 5,000 patients, but how can you possibly optimize the health of 5,000 patients? I couldn't. I know I couldn't. It's impossible for me. Yeah, I, I agree. So you, what we could do is work better to, with the patients we have. And there's always an ability to have more doctors. There are absolutely a lot of doctors. It's just that the way the market works now is no one wants to go to family medicine. Not no one. Very few people want to go to family medicine because it's such a, you know, it's viewed as a second tier specialty. You, you're relatively paid less, and then the biggest thing is just the the, the brow beating that you get. Right. right. Yeah. It's it's interesting. I I think the the physician shortage is a is a very real conversation. Uh, the idea that we can correct it with changing reimbursements. I, I think there needs to be a a complete cultural shift to to the way we're approaching. Uh, medicine and the delivery of medicine, and I mm-hmm. the, I liken it to the way we approach our schools in the sense that uh, if there's a teacher shortage, the worst thing we can do is is plug more students into the into the to the classroom. That's going to going to exacerbate the problem in the sense that the teachers going to the existing teachers are going to be burnt out, mm-hmm. and when those aspiring teachers see the writing on the wall, they're thinking, I'm not going to do that. Right. So I think to change the movement, I think it's, it's several fold. It's, it's folks, a uh, changing the way this, we practice our our craft Mm -hmm. and fostering that movement. And then I think the mid levels and we're at Griffin concierge, we were one of the first practices to incorporate a physician assistant. Yeah. As far as I know, I don't know of any others. I mean, I know there are others, but I don't know of any others personally. So talk about how you arrived at that idea. Yeah, it, it was really uh, quite organic in the sense that as you go along in practice and your practice grows, uh, the amount of time we spend in, in the room with the patient, as you know, is can be quite long. Mm-hmm. Uh, but part of what we do uh, w- in our practice is open the lines of communication. So uh, patients will call and I'm in the room two hours with a patient on a physical and there may be a problem, right. uh, say a cold, a particular issue, maybe they need some counseling. So in concert medicine, uh, I think telemedicine is, is built right in. You handle a lot of things over the phone, a lot of counseling, long gone are the days of, well, you need to come in for an appointment. Right. No, we try to handle that, that right away. Mm-hmm. 
So for me, the where our practice was heading, we had a very, uh, I think, uh, strong telemedicine uh, patient population. Mm-hmm. They love to communicate via telephone call, email, text. And but you're like only that. so busy. I mean, you right. can only have so many right. people going we, at once. And we wanted to service them in a, in a in a very efficient way. And the idea was, well, gosh, I don't necessarily want uh, a medical assistant handling these calls. They don't they don't have the training. Mm-hmm. And so we were introduced to Mary Catherine Charles, who mm-hmm. was uh, training at the time. And she agreed to join our practice the last several months of her uh, physician's assistant school. And we got to, to know what a wonderful person she was. And the idea there was, you know, if we could have someone like this who's trained the way we're trained as, as physicians, um, who has the medical knowledge, who has the ability to prescribe, we thought that would be a real winner. And we had no idea uh, the way it would translate in the future. And what we found uh, is that I lost quite a few of my personal patients to Mary uh. Catherine. And it's the and and looking back, I think, gosh, this is really terrific from a physician's assistant perspective because she and myself and Dr. Saint Clair, the collaboration we have on a daily basis at our practice is really unlike any other. It's it's more than I ever had in residency training. Uh, because usually, usually when you're talking to your fellow residents, you don't know anything. No one knows anything. You're just mm-hmm. you're sharing ideas with right. each other. Uh, and this the blind leading the blind. Well, pretty much. <laughs> and this, what we found with Mary Catherine is such an empathetic, uh, intelligent practitioner. And at the end, end of the day, that's really what a lot of our patients, if not most patients, want. They want someone who who can listen, who can troubleshoot a problem for them, make the just the most appropriate recommendation for them. Of course, with the support of of their supervising MD or DO. Mm-hmm. And it's really worked out well for us. And as I think of the the movement uh, uh, overall, and we look at the physician shortage and provider shortage that is is bearing down on our country, you think, wow, what what role does a physician assistant and a nurse practitioner play in this movement? We we realize we're going to need those practitioners to be a part and step up in the system. But do we want to throw them into the existing broken system? I don't think that's a great idea. Right. And that's a, you know, I've, you know, I've, I've thought that there's a whole, you know, I think you said it before, it's its own specialty, you know, concierge medicine. And I think, you know, in addition to physicians being trained, you know, there's going to have to be some training of mid-levels and Absolutely. also of, of staff. You know, it's not like your normal front desk operation, you know, so much more involved some from a uh, I guess you call it a personal standpoint right. you know we're not just like checking to make sure you have uh, your your authorization or something you know there's it's a lot more so there's gonna have to be training of you know administrative staff obviously operational right. staff so it's a it's a it's a older it's not new it's 20 years old but it's still growing I think it's Absolutely. still almost since infancy right if not in taller stages right and, and with with our middle-level practitioner what her her practice has truly grown organically she we don't advertise her as a we don't we don't aver, advertise her as an option for new patients her practice has grown from her relationships with our existing patients mm-hmm. and even uh, I mentioned my some of my former patients I mean, they're all still all of our patients in our in our practice uh, there's just a, a, a comfort level that uh, these folks have with Mary Catherine and and what can you say it's and they refer their family their children and that's how she's built her practice is really from within and then how did you arrive at hiring another physician what made you decide to do that well we were fortunate to reach a, a threshold in in our practice we really wanted to keep a, a ratio uh, of of really around 300 patients uh, per per physician, the idea there was it. There's when we when we talk about how many patients do we want to add to our concierge practice or our DPC practice, I think there's some math involved here. Uh, a there's there's math of membership, uh, but then there's a there is a relationship be- between how many patients you have on your roster and how does that translate to your day-to-day schedule? Right. And I think that's something that's figured out and it's a very individual and personalized process. So as, as I was building up my roster, my, I, I could see my comfort level uh, per day and it was a very slow process and you could start thinking, wow, that was a busy day today in a sense of right. uh, I, was, I felt uh, overly ex- 
extended and I felt like not that, you know, we in concierge medicine, we don't look at busy based on volume. We look at busy based on the, the cases we have in front of us. Right. And, I, and am I able to accomplish everything that I needed for those patients that day? Yeah. And that's the key is it's not about just a list of things. It's doing them fast. Yeah. Or not fast, doing them efficiently. Yeah, and completing them. And, so and, if someone needs yeah. something, I want it taken care of because they want it Correct. taken care of. So yeah. I was reaching, you know, when I was reaching around 300 patients, that translated to so many patients in the office per day. Let's say let's say six to, to 10 in the office per day. And that's not including the calls. And right. that's not including the, the th- other things we do in our office as far as uh, injection, blood draws, um, mm-hmm. uh, other other pickups, things like that, where people are stopping by to to receive some sort of um, uh, collaboration or care from us. Mm-hmm. So we're thinking, well, gosh, that's if I add any more patients, that's really going to disrupt something that's it's really going to uh, squeeze my time even more. Mm-hmm. And so the decision, and and tr- the other thing too was we we don't want to throw up our shingle and just start adding patients at a breakneck pace, we want to really take our time, get to know our patients. It's very labor intensive in the beginning with our patients, getting to know them. Yes. And to add patients is uh, at a too brisk of a rate is is not desirable. At least Mm -hmm. it wasn't for us. So unfortunately, I didn't have a plan in place. Surprise, surprise. Uh, When we reached a uh, threshold, when I reached my threshold, so we started a waiting list. Mm. It's a very, very uh, difficult thing to do because there was folks who we felt really needed us, right? Um, but we weren't in a position; we didn't have the infrastructure in place to take on. More how patients. long did the people stay on the waiting list, or how long did you have a waiting list? Well, we we implemented a waiting list. Uh, I want to say about six months. Wow! And the idea there was to uh, really identify. Uh, who are we going to bring into our practice? And and it was really by chance we were my wife and I were sitting in in my office one day and and a, a drug rep came in who was also a family friend and, mm-hmm. and just mentioned it was a more of a social visit. He said, "You know, is there, gosh, is there anything I can do for you?" And my wife heard that in passing. She's like, "Well, if you know of a good family physician, let us know." Mm-hmm. And he paused and he said, "I might know the perfect person for you." And we were all ears, and he gave the number of Doctor Saint Clair, and it probably right after he left the office, I was I was blowing up her cell phone. Yeah, and we had the, a, a terrific initial conversation, and what that conversation was like was re, me really relaying my enjoyment of the way I practice medicine. We didn't talk about her; it was really just me, right, uh, invigorating. Uh, she told me this, invigorating her about Absolutely. practicing medicine again. Imagine getting that call. I'd like to get that. <laughs> if I would, hey, you want to? Yeah. So, when can I start? <laughs> so we we um, it, it was really one of those things where I said, "Hey, look, we're and and Doctor Saint Clair was in Atlanta at the time. Yeah, and and we oh, we, so she we, had to relocate. Very much so, and I think we just caught her at the uh, uh, at that. I think that turning point that I think most physicians have in their career where they think, okay, this is really um, not my cup of tea at the moment. And is there something else out there for me? And it was just really fortuitous for us to make that connection. So if there's doctors out there right now, you know, what are some of the main things that you think of as a, as a concierge medicine physician to kind of dispel as far as instead of taking the leap? Is it worth it? Is it, uh, is it too dangerous? And what do you, what do you think? What would the civilians came to you and said, look, Dr. Griffin, I would like to do what you do, but I can't because of what? So financially, there's a risk financially, right. potentially. Right. So if you, but if you were going to start your own business, that's one thing. But if you're going to be an employee, then there's, there's no real difference, is there? Financially, if you're going to join a, if you're going to join a concierge medicine practice, I mean, you're, you're making at least as much money as you would make as a, um, as a person working in a hospital situation, wouldn't you? Well, yeah, you, I mean, that's the idea. You do want to, you'd like to make the same income, if not a little bit better than what you were doing, but also be able to practice in a way right. that is just extremely professionally fulfilling. Uh, so it is tough. I think if a person's out there and they're, they're being recruited by a concierge office, uh, 
I, th- I think it's important for the existing practice to be solvent. You don't want to relocate right. or join another practice right, then, huh, if closed. they're going to go belly up. But it's it's a there is a, a very big risk, and and uh, there's always a the concern of, gosh, I hope I hope the the patients like our our new physician. But you do the yeah. best you can with with getting to know someone, um, but you know, really getting to know them uh, before they join your your team and your culture. What do you think about this? This is one of the things that I know that some doctors have is a fear of blowback. So they'll be accused of being, I've been accused of being unethical Hmm. on Facebook. If you're out there listening. And what? Yeah. Because we did a, uh, it was Bill Cosart and I did this uh, event, Med First Productions, which is a promotional event, promotional arm of Med First Partners. Anyway, so we did this, you you remember the movie event? Oh, yes. Yeah. So we did the movie event and this lady said, Oh, uh, what you're doing is disgusting. You shouldn't even have a license. You shouldn't practice medicine. All because we're inviting people to come to a free movie. Huh. But there's a lot of animosity towards anyone who objects, I guess, to whatever your particular personal belief is. And so I think a lot of a lot of physicians are scared that they'll be accused. You know, there's a lot of people who say concierge medicine is only for the wealthy. And if you if you do concierge medicine, then you're an elitist and all that. I think a lot of doctors would be scared about that. Yeah, I, I, I think that. I, I think I felt a little bit of that in the beginning. Um, I think there was a time when I felt, and I still feel, I, I 100% agree that concierge medicine is th- this style of practice and this delivery of primary care is beneficial for 100% of people. And it's, but is, is our practices aren't necessarily uh, for everyone, just like uh, we have to have uh, patients who want to join us for the the philosophy that mm-hmm. that we are preaching. Right. And so I think in the beginning, yeah, I thought, gosh, let me try to convince everyone that this is the the right answer for them. And I realized that, and I can't do that. I want to I want to treat patients who mm-hmm. want to be uh, who are looking for something more, just as I was looking for something more. And that's who we want in our our practice mm-hmm. are people who want to be a part of us. Um, again, there's no coercion from our part. Yeah, our, we don't force our, any fines if you don't join. Our coercion is is really ter- you know terrific in the sense that we want to provide the absolute best care as we know how to do it in, mm-hmm. a, in a way that is communicative, protective of our patients as well, and also preventative. Well, if you look at membership medicine as a whole, so direct primary care and concierge medicine, it runs the gamut. I mean, there may be practice. I've seen practice out there charge you know, less than $20 a month, depending sure. on your age. So there's a whole variety of practices out there. And it's not to say everyone belongs on one certain one. But I think a lot of it is is this breaking this dogma that somehow or another, every medical, every aspect of your medical life should be paid for by a card in your wallet sure. or purse. Sure. And it has to have a copay assigned to it. And it has to have a code assigned to it. And it has to have someone in some faraway office approve it. And if you don't do that, then you're somehow, you're doing things a little bit shady. Right, right. And I think we have to break beyond that. And I think we are. Yeah, I think there's something pure about it. I mean, there's there's nothing more, uh, I, I believe, purer than, and it's really great for us as physicians when, when a, a, one of our clients is paying us their hard-earned dollars. Exactly. What a feeling that is. Gosh, you know, you're, it's, you're it's, honored. It's an honor. Exactly. I was just going to say, it's such an honor and it's also a responsibility. Sure. Because here they are. They're not forced to pay you. Right. You know, they're not forced because you're in their network and you're the only doctor within 20 miles. Right. And here you are. Right. No, they're actually giving you their money, their hard earned money. Mm-hmm. I wish our politicians felt the same way. <laughs> uh, anyway, I, I, they're get, we're giving us their hard earned money. Right. And so we have to make good on that promise to optimize their health, to be there for them when they need us. And, um, that's, that's a very good point, but it's such a, a reward. I remember the first time I told Tracy, I said, you know what? It's such a different feeling from, uh, you know, when you have an income that is derived from people willingly paying you versus, and not to say everyone has to do this, but if you get paid from a corporation, you get paid and it's, you know, it shows up in your account and sure you did a good job. But when someone has given you their hard earned money personally, right. it's such a, it's an, it's such a, a responsibility, I think, more than any a responsibility and an honor to have members that pay you for, for your care. Right. I, I think, and I would invite those that, that either physicians who are, are, are wary or hesitant, uh, and even patients, it, it, those that are, are maybe have a negative uh, feeling about this delivery, I, I would encourage them to, to educate themselves and, and maybe even 
take a leap and be a part of a practice where, yeah. gosh, you're 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 cherished and you're valued, and not that you're not in the other practice, but there's something about that direct responsibility right. that you have and that direct relationship that you have with your patient that is is really I can't say it any other way. It's quite pure and it's a really great thing. And it's a great option, and that's one of the things I like to say is. You know, when you see these detractors, and I see them on LinkedIn all the time, you know what I'm talking about. Anyway, uh, they call and they say, uh, or they'll comment and they'll say, this is whatever. They'll use their negative commentary. I'm like, look, all I'm saying is, why shouldn't people have the option? Are you saying that, I'm not saying everyone should be in membership medicine. Don't be if you don't want to, but you should have the option. But a lot of these people just don't, they don't want anything to do it. They don't want you to have that option. They're very dogmatic in their belief, like I was saying before, that whatever is outside of their little uh, silo of what they think medicine should be delivered is off limits. And they don't like options. So one of the quotes I like is, a lot of the opposition to free markets is opposition to freedom itself. And that's like Milton Friedman said, is a lot of the opposition you'll find to to free free markets and medical care or anything is people don't even, at the base, a lot of those people don't even believe in freedom itself. They'll say they do, but really in the bottom of their minds, they know what's best for you. But everyone knows what's best for them. And whether you are wanting to be in an insurance practice or a membership medicine practice, that's what's best for you. And you should be able to make that decision. Not the government, not me, not Dr. Griffin. Yeah. What's so great about it, too, is that we, you and I, we can make the decision to practice concierge medicine all day long. But we... We, we don't have the power. Our, our patients have the power. Yes. They're the ones that if yes. we're doing a terrific job by them in the sense that we're, we're doing what we say we're going to do, communicate, prevent, coach, be there for them. And they're the ones that, that validate what we're doing. And they're the reason we're here year after year because they continue to want to be a part of what we're providing. So, Again, it's. I, I remember remember in the very beginning when I opened up, I had uh, delusions of grandeur, and I thought, "Oh gosh, this I, I'm going to just have so many patients, and uh-huh. this is going to be." And we open, you know, the doors and and turn on the phones and crickets, you know, yeah. nothing, nothing happening. And what do you do? You it's just tough. have to have faith. Faith, you, you do. And and one thing and we work. learned in moving to a new city and a uh, being a new doctor is it takes time. Mm-hmm. It takes, especially in our style of medicine that is based on relationships. You have to be in your community. Um, trust and reputation does not happen overnight. And there, there's definitely a, a proving that has to take place. And so we, and there, thank goodness for our, our initial patients who, who gave me a chance. I remember I was 31 years old, and we had a patient uh, join our practice, and he looked at me and he said, "You know, you look a little bit too young." He goes, "I, I think next time you send out an ad, you need to draw in a beard <laughs> or, or sprinkle in some gray hair." But yeah. I'm so thankful to to, uh, and if he's listening, he knows who he is. Yeah. I'm just so thankful to he and his wife who. Who gave us a chance, and yeah. it, we wouldn't be here without without those folks. Yeah. What do you think about uh, if you're gonna? You know, I have this. I have this fantasy. I don't know if it's a fantasy or a plan. That I want to open up another office in a different city. Have you ever thought about doing that? Well, or, or a different office in general, or another office? You know, I I do. I have I have visions uh, of doing all sorts of things. Yeah. <laughs> as far as that goes, I, I think I, I want to open up one in Gainesville. My, my role is Gainesville has a need for sure. I, I from think what they I do. Hear. Oh yeah. It's one of those things too. I think as I've gone along and wanted to have these, um, I've had these ideas of doing the next thing. It's been so wonderful to have, uh, Lauren, our, our, uh, COO really keeping me in check and mm-hmm. and one of the things she's really brought to our business is uh, the the understanding of let's perfect and, or as best we can perfect what we're trying to do mm-hmm. and uh, create the infrastructure that we need mm-hmm. and then maybe we could talk about what the next step is for us but no I, I agree I you you get so excited about the delivery style and yeah. you think gosh there's you can just picture it somewhere uh, else absolutely like um, Town of Tioga is where I want to open one. They've got this little, okay. they have this town center. It's got three levels. I think the first level's uh, commercial, and then the top two levels are residential. Hmm. I was thinking I would get an apartment right there and have an office here, and then there's a world of beer right there. That's perfect. Yeah. Can you imagine? <laughs> All you need. 
I think I would yeah, move there maybe. And, That's great. But anyway, tell us one before we go. I want to thank you for the diet advice you gave us. We alluded to it before the yeah. uh, no starch, no sugar diet. You had great success with this. <clears throat> this diet here is one of the things that I love about it is that you can eat not all you want, but you don't have to starve yourself. And when you first turned me on to this, um, I never, I didn't really undertake it because I don't know why I didn't need to go on a diet. But then for the wedding, I wanted to lose uh, 10 pounds. I lost 11 pounds in great. like three weeks or four weeks. Great. And I'm not going to be murdered later for saying that by, you know, who. But anyway, I'm not, I, I lost a lot of weight. Okay. And what do you think about that diet? It's not for everybody, obviously. There's some. Well, I don't know. I, I, I tell patients that the diet only works for 100% of people who try it. Oh, there okay? you go. So, That's right. Though. So it, there's it, so a little background. Uh, I read a book by Gary Taubes in 2012 that, that I've, I've posted before completely changed the way I, I, I would say practice medicine. Uh, coming from the University of Florida, uh, a nutrition major, uh, this information was completely foreign to me. It's, it's, and it's, it's against the orthodoxy. Well, sure. And the, the orthodoxy at the time, uh, and it probably still is, is still the calories in, calories out phenomenon. And this turned me on to the hormonal uh, uh, challenges or, or the condition of gaining weight due to hormonal differences that we all have. So, for instance, we all agree that testosterone is the hormone that builds muscle. So, but understanding that all testosterone is not created equal, testosterone in Arnold Schwarzenegger will build greater muscle than testosterone in Radley Griffin, mm -hmm. even though we may have the same levels. So understanding the nuances of each of our hormones are, is really quite fascinating, the way our tissues accept those hormones, how they grow accordingly. And we, I learned from, from Gary Taub's insulin is, a, is the, the antithesis to testosterone. And realizing that, wow, insulin is really playing a significant role in our metabolism. Mm -hmm. And it's doing it, virtually every, I, I feel the, almost every patient is in the metabolic syndrome PCOS spectrum, mm -hmm. meaning uh, their insulin does different things to them. So a, a lipidologist once said insulin is good for three things, making plaque, making us fat, but also keeping us alive. So hmm. it's the, it's the, it's the devil and the angel all in one. Mm -hmm. And so what we're finding is, is that, gosh, we want to recognize what insulin has done to each particular person. Maybe one person is gaining significant amount of weight. Their insulin is putting them in a complete fat storage state. Another person, maybe they're on a, they're not getting a morbid obesity, but they're getting a lot of truncal obesity. Mm -hmm. Maybe their insulin is causing them to, is becoming overly resistant and they're becoming a diabetic, but they remain thin. Mm -hmm. And so understanding how insulin is interacting in each person's body, I think is the first recognition. And then, then say, okay, now that we have that recognition, what do we do about it? Well, we actually don't consume the foods that cause insulin to rise, mm -hmm. which are basically mainly fat. Mm -hmm. And protein does cause insulin. So those rise. cause it not to rise. Fat does not interact with insulin. Right. Protein does, interestingly, uh, too much protein, I can't tell you how much, mm -hmm. can actually convert to glucose. So, right. uh, But we still, we still generally have our patients on a, I don't want to say a high protein diet, uh, but a more a, a fat and protein dominant. So the things diet. that will make glu insulin spike are simple sugars, yes, and carbohydrates in general. Correct. I mean, some insulin, like you said, is necessary to keep you alive. Oh, it absolutely. drives blood into the cells, or I'm sorry, glucose into the cells. But yeah, the 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 simple sugars, the readily available, like glucose, for instance, or uh, sucrose. If you eat table mm -hmm. sugar, almost a almost a hundred percent efficiency of either using it, which you're not going to use at all or converting it to fat for storage. Correct. And it's or what, glycogen. It's interesting. There is a difference between our sugars for sure. And the, the sugar that comes from table sugar and, and fructose, uh, we think are, are the most uh, harmful for patients, but there's a threshold that's reached where your body becomes so sensitive to, and we'll call it intolerant to glucose, the body stops telling the difference between fructose, sucrose, and just plain glucose that one gets from, say, a potato or a carrot, something like that. Mm -hmm. So the idea is that when we look at a patient, especially in our office, and we have a really neat uh, body composition machine there that it measures something that I feel is the most important measurement is not BMI, not percent body fat, but visceral fat. Mm -hmm. So visceral fat, 
we know is the most inflammatory uh, form so of that's fat. So the fat around your organs. Correct, yes. And so we want to, when we're recognizing that a patient has a, an increased visceral fat, personally, being a thin guy, I had increased visceral fat. Right. And what we do know is that body habitus and um, muscle mass and yeah, how in shape we are don't dictate whether or not we're going to die from that heart attack or that stroke. Right. Um, th- those things don't discriminate. Mm-hmm. So we do know that, and even cholesterol, it's interesting when we're looking at cholesterol, uh, cholesterol, half of people who have heart attacks have normal cholesterol. So we start looking at what are the ways we can make a difference, and we start saying, let's start attacking that visceral fat. Let's look at your insulin level. Let's see if you're trending toward a metabolic syndrome state, which we would call high glucose, high insulin, high triglycerides, low HDL or good cholesterol. Mm-hmm. And in fact, even in men, even their testosterone is low. impacted right. by this phenomenon as well. Right. And let's start reversing those trends. So I ask a question to our patients. Do you need to burn organ fat, visceral fat? And we either say yes or no. So mm-hmm. most say, yes, I do. Mm-hmm. And then we ask the question, does the food I'm eating or is this the food in my hand allow me to burn fat. So how do we burn fat? Well, we basically eliminate the foods that provide us quick energy, which are basically carbohydrates. Mm-hmm. And if we eliminate the carbohydrates and even alcohol, you can imagine if your body is burning ethanol, you're not burning fat. So if we're eliminating carbohydrates and not total elimination, but drastic elimination, our body is then forced to look for energy sources from another place. And the next available source is our fat stores, specifically mm-hmm. our organ fat or visceral fat. So we allow our body to do that. And then we shrink down. And it works pretty rapidly. It really does. And, and people can get frustrated with, with the pace or they get stuck. And so we try to employ different strategies for them. Mm-hmm. And the way we think about that too is we, we tend to, as humans, we tend to gain weight in a real stepwise fashion. We, we go up over the years mm-hmm. and we add to our fat stores depending on what we're eating at the time. Mm-hmm. And so the fat we gained four decades ago is sometimes what we're finding is really difficult to break open and, and uh, expose the, the triglycerides inside that fat tissue, which hopefully turn into ketone bodies, which is our indication of fat burning. And it, it takes time and there's different strategies, but we, if we're reminded that that fat was created four decades ago mm-hmm. and, and realize the tissue is really resistant to releasing its ingredients, um, and it, that's why it's a challenge. That's why as people go on this diet and they'll lose significant weight initially mm-hmm. and they're not to their complete reset point, we have to come up with strategic ways to help them break into that, we'll call it old fat. Yeah, that sounds like an interesting topic for another whole show. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, thank you, Riley. I mean, thank you. It's a pleasure to see you. We don't get to see each other as often as we'd like. I know. We're very close in the city, but we're both busy. But again, thank you for all your help over the years and continued help and continued good success with thank you. Griffin Concierge Medical. And if you're interested in learning more about his practice in South Tampa, pre-minute practice in Tampa, GriffinConciergeMedical.com, right? Yes. It's good to see you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Until next time, bye-bye.